So I've been following Jasper Flick's movement tutorial series on catlikecoding.com. If you're interested in following along yourself, then there's links in the doobly-doo. I started out with a ball and a plane, and a red trail so I could see where the ball has been, and began by adding player input axes, <laughs> which uh, resulted in the ball immediately reaching Mach 10, so I had to clamp that down a bit. Before long, I had a working play area with well-defined borders, acceleration, and velocity mechanics, and a satisfying bounce. Then I made my first deviation from the tutorial. I wondered if I could add the looping mechanic from Pac-Man, where it wraps around on itself like a 2D projection of a torus. This was easy enough by removing the bounciness and swapping the X and Y positions at each border. Then an epiphany hit me. Could I do the same with a disc? Within minutes I was looking up the Unity manual for different classes or methods I could use to achieve the same effect on a circle. I found the clamp magnitude function which defined the play area to a radius, and then added a very simple if statement that inverted your distance from the origin when you cross that border. This was a very special moment to me, and I'm glad I caught it on video, so please let me share it with you. Oh my god! Yes! <laughs> yes! Wow! Oh, this is so cool! <laughs> now, I normally have a very monotone voice, so... I hope you can hear the genuine excitement there. Why was I so excited? Well, for years I've been imagining a type of projective geometry that I've been tentatively calling Loka Space, named after my long-term world-building project. It was the seed that sort of set me on this long journey in the first place. If you go back in my video feed, you'll find the stream where I first talked about it and made some hand-drawn animations as examples. But being able to literally play in an albeit simplified version of this space was pretty mind-blowing to me. It makes me wonder where I'd been now if I'd just tried to do this when I first thought of it, rather than being dismissive and thinking that I had no idea how to code. <laughs> and maybe that should make you wonder what it is that you're putting off doing. Either way, this little fun movement demo means a lot to me, and I see it as my first major flagstone in the foundations I need to build great games in the future. Satisfied, the next day I continued the tutorials. I created a more realistic bounding box, added jumping, tested different slopes and incline angles, added stairs using the Pro Builder Unity package, and learned about masking layers, so that the ball can slide up and down on an invisible ramp rather than getting stuck on all the bumps. I ended that day with some debugging when a ball lands in a pit and can't correctly make contact with the ground layer, and added wall jumping, because who doesn't love wall jumping? The next day I started work on a third-person camera system, first by getting it to follow from a fixed perspective, then adding rotational controls with the IJKL keys, and finally adding mouse controls. But it was quite jittery and sensitive, and I didn't like it. Now, I don't know about you, but I find playing third-person games, and especially platformers, very difficult on mouse and keyboard. So I knew I wanted to work out how to get a controller working with this as quickly as possible. And it turns out that Unity uses an arbitrary number of independently controlled axes, which you can assign any keyboard or controller inputs to. So after some trial and error, I was able to find my PS4 controller's button mappings and got the ball rolling and the camera orbiting smoothly. Much better. Unity also makes it really easy to invert the camera axes, which I also tend to prefer. <laughs> so now I know that if I ever see a game made in Unity that doesn't offer inverted camera controls, 
There really is no excuse. Those devs are just plain stubborn or lazy. A nice quality of life addition was to make the camera raycast for intersecting objects between itself and the player, and to pull closer when it detects something so that it doesn't clip through walls and such. Also, blindly following along with the tutorial, I started adding an auto-rotate feature that would align the camera with your direction that you're traveling in after a few moments, until I remembered that I hate that feature in most games that have it, and just moved on. First thing to do was disable Unity's built-in gravity engine, and write a new one that could change the direction of gravity based on the position of the ball. This began with just a giant sphere as the play area, and a script that would pull the player into the origin of the scene unless they collided with something. Which is simple enough if your game only contains one planet that you can never leave, but games like Mario Galaxy have more dynamic gravity mechanics. So I made a gravity plane with editor visible gizmos that make visualizing their strength and direction easier and then had to fix the way that the camera rotates when you leave one gravity field and enter another. And later on fixed issues with overlapping gravity planes so that the transition is smoother. While playing around I also gave each side of this box a different strength of gravity each equivalent to some of the planets in our solar system, so that was fun to see what jumping on Mars might feel like. Then it was onto the planetoids. More gizmos, more complicated scripts. Inverted spheres, spheres within spheres, and to my surprise the most complicated piece cuboids that dynamically pull you to their nearest surface, rather than pulling you to the center of gravity like a realistically massive object would. The display gizmos and maths for these boxes were really a head-scratcher at times, but I pushed through it. And now I have a very basic Super Mario Galaxy clone. But what 3D platformer would be complete without well, platforms. Next up was learning about animation. Simple up and down, side to side, round and round. Which was actually more complicated than it seemed at first, since physics objects didn't always behave as expected. Even Galilean relativity can be hard to wrap your head around sometimes. After all these years, inertial frames of reference are something that I still don't fully understand the physics of even if the maths is just vector calculus. Anyway, one of my favorite recent developments in the third-person action games genre is the addition of climbing mechanics, like in Breath of the Wild or Genshin Impact, where you can climb almost any surface. So I was excited to get on with the next part of the tutorial, adding just that. Though, in appearance right now, I guess it looks more like the Spider Ball from Metroid Prime. As with stairs, I was able to put different objects on different mask layers, so in this case the orange walls weren't climbable, but the white walls were. And I added a debug effect that changed the color of the ball to symbolize when I was climbing. Next was swimming. More complicated again, but related to the gravity scripts. Initially just adding buoyancy so that the ball floats, and then adding a button to dive and rise up and adjusting the camera again to be more dynamic whilst you're swimming. The hardest part of this tutorial was actually adding buoyancy to other objects. Getting small debris to float was simple, but these large floating boxes caused me no end of issues. The basic method involved adding a buoyant point in each corner, or along the length, but they kept floating in mid-air, getting sucked down to the bottom of the pool or just levitating away. Eventually I got it working well enough and just moved on. For good measure I also added water cubes to the moving platforms and tried relative movement while swimming, which actually worked surprisingly well with very few changes. It all just fell out of solution. <laughs> Lastly, I was introduced to trigger conditions scripts, a primitive form of scriptable object I think, 
Using them, I made acceleration pads, bouncy castles, buttons that could activate elevators or moving platforms, which could then be held down by other objects, and I started getting Portal 2 vibes around this point. All in all, completing these tutorials took around eight full days of work spread over about two weeks. I'm really proud of what I've accomplished so far, and I'm really pleased with what I've learned. Just playing around in this little sandbox is really fun, and I'm looking forward to learning more soon. But something else that was on my mind over those two weeks was artificial intelligence, or more specifically, sound design. I'd watched a GDC talk about granular synthesis, where you take tiny audio samples called grains from a source file and run them through a synthesizer to generate new, unheard, but similar sounds. We're just going to play around with the values ourselves. For example, I can increase the number of frames per second, or the amount of noise in the sound, or the parameters of the loudness. There's a website called mynoise.net that does something similar to generate ambience, and I began wondering what other applications that sort of technology might have. Then I remembered the way that characters talk in games like Banjo-Kazooie and Animal Crossing, and I started wondering how I might add voices to characters in my games without having to hire voice actors. I also saw a tool for Skyrim modding that came out a little while back that used a generative adversarial network to reproduce the cast of Skyrim's voices as a text-to-speech synthesizer. There are several use cases for this, such as dialogue for quest mods, expanding or fixing existing dialogue machinima, and more. And this sent me down quite the wild rabbit hole. Suddenly, I was watching three blue, one brown videos, reading about the ethics of deepfakes, cloning GitHub repos, installing NVIDIA CUDA, banging my head against my desk trying to get TensorFlow installed, and eventually got a tool called WaveGAN working, only to be thoroughly disappointed with its ability to convincingly reproduce my voice. Welcome to the toolbox to begin loading utterance from your data set to record with yourself. But still, that's not too bad considering that it had no training on my voice. That said, the thing that I really wanted to use it for was to use sound effects like birdsong or the wind, or <laughs> the sound of someone ice skating as an input, and then make it talk. And that failed spectacularly. Welcome to the toolbox to begin loading utterance from your data sets and record one yourself. It really is only trained for human voices, it seems, so I'm back to square one on this one and I need to do more research before I so boldly try to enslave these sounds again. Still, speaking of sound effects, I found an incredible resource in the form of Marcel Gnuck's freetousesounds.com. He travels around the world collecting high-quality sound effects and releases them royalty-free. Now, that's free to use, not free to buy but you can get his whole discography over a terabyte of sound effects on Bandcamp for only about $20 with an 80% discount code, so definitely worth checking out. I'm personally really passionate about high-quality sound effects in games. I think they're the thing that adds the most to the game feel, and a lot of indie developers seem to forget about good quality sound effects or just seem to have trouble sourcing them. And it is a lot of work to source sounds of this quality, so I'm happy to endorse Marcel's work if it helps other devs discover that one special noise they've been looking for. This isn't an ad, by the way, I just really like these sound effects. <laughs> and uh, speaking of discovery, one thing I want to try to do with these devlogs is shout out other indie game developers' channels so that we can all lift each other up and build a better community here on YouTube. 
So today's shout out is for ASMR game dev and fellow Brit Rob Lang. Rob is currently making a cute co-op steampunk puzzle exploration game called Plomper. His videos are a lot more regular and thorough than mine, and in some cases border on being full tutorials in their own right. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. He's got a kind heart and a bright vision, and I'm excited to see where his projects go. Last thing I tried working on was putting my newly learned skills to the test. I wanted to try making a game in a day, and decided that the simplest game I could try making was Snakes and Ladders. Actually, it's debatable whether or not Snakes and Ladders is actually a game, or just an allegory for life. It turns out it's one of the oldest games ever made, originating in India and called Moksha Patam, which roughly translates to falling and emancipation, until it was culturally appropriated and rebranded as Shoots and Ladders in the 40s. It's a well-solved mathematical problem, though. The game basically plays itself, and you're guaranteed to win eventually if you play it alone. I started off with a grid and a player token, and defined the space that it could move in, using a couple of if statements and a function to make it advance alternating left to right up the board, adding a random number generator, and the movement was essentially complete. I wanted to make it more versatile, though, I mean, what if I wanted to make my board an arbitrary shape? A circular, spirally board instead of a square, lefty-righty board, you know? Well, right now my code worked, but wasn't smart, and programming in individual snakes and ladders would be a nightmare. So I wondered if there was a way to do it procedurally. I started looking up splines, and eventually found a free Unity add-on called Spline Mesh that let me populate a Bezier curve with objects. So first I used it to place the board numbers, and to generate those numbers inside a for loop using Text Mesh Pro. And I was about to start using it to try to define movement when... The stock market all but exploded on Tuesday the 28th of January. Wall Street's bets was taking on Melvin Capital. And I was suddenly reminded that I'd been planning to put some of my money away into cryptocurrencies and stocks last year, and had completely forgotten to do anything about it until now. So I kind of just dropped everything I was doing. <laughs> and the last couple of weeks have been spent desperately researching where to safely invest some of my savings during this bull market. In hindsight, I really wish I'd been more on the ball about this earlier in the year considering that Bitcoin was only like $5,000 not too long ago and just hit 50 k this week. But, oh well, here we are. At least I've set up my PC to mine cryptos while I sleep now. Getting back into programming again after that awful distraction has been difficult though. I've had zero motivation to continue working on Snakes and Ladders, and all of my larger game ideas are still a little too ambitious for me to want to start working on them yet. So I've actually decided to drop Unity completely just for this month, and to try learning a lower level system language. I was gonna try C or C++, because they're the industry standard, but then I remembered that I'm not beholden to anyone, and I'd rather learn something more cutting edge. So I picked up Rust the highly performant WebAssembly language created by the Mozilla Foundation. I'm not sure how directly applicable it will be to game design, but I'm keen just to get some more general programming experience under my belt too. Plus, I've heard that the Godot engine has a Rust add-on, and that there are also a couple of data-driven game engines in the works too, like Bevy and Amethyst, so I might try them out at some point. Either way, I've only just started with Rust, so goodbye and hello world, as always.